Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Colonel Pat Howell. I am the director of the Modern War Institute and I'm today's host. We are honored to welcome Master Sergeant Retired and Congressional Medal of Honor recipient Leroy Petrie. Master Sergeant Petrie is a native of New Mexico who enlisted in the Army in 1999. After completion of one station unit training, the basic airborne course, and the Ranger Assessment and Selection Program, all at Fort Benning, Petrie was assigned to 2nd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. He served as a grenadier, squad automatic rifleman, fire team leader, squad leader, operations sergeant, and a weapons, and a weapons squad leader. Messenger Sergeant Petrie deployed multiple times in support of overseas contingency operations to Iraq and to Afghanistan. At the time of the May 26, 2008 combat engagement in Paktia province, for which he received the Congressional Medal of Honor, Master Sergeant Petrie, he was a Staff Sergeant Squad Leader assigned to Delta Company, 2nd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. Master Sergeant Petrie and his wife have four children. When he is not spending time with his family, he enjoys golf, pheasant hunting, and fishing. On behalf of the Commandant and Cadets, Brigadier General Curtis Buzzard, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Modern War Institute, please welcome Master Sergeant Petrie to our virtual stage. Leroy, I'd like to thank you for your time and insights today, and will now tell you about the primary audience for your talk. You're currently addressing a little over a thousand cadets that are from the class of 2023. They're currently in their second semester of their sophomore year, in about three to three and a half years, depending on which schooling they do, particularly who goes to ranger school, they'll be leading platoons of 30 to 40 soldiers as platoon leaders. Because this talk is focused on these future leaders, you and I will have a short 20, 25 minutes of Q&A, and then we're going to open up the floor to the cadets as well as anyone else who's dialed in online. To begin with, could you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to join the Army uh, in 1999 and more specifically, why the Ranger Regiment? Uh, it, it had been a lifelong decision for, for me. Uh, since I was about seven years old, uh, I started asking the questions. My mom had a cousin deployed to Desert Storm or Shield, whatever was going on at that time. And, and uh, I, I started wondering, why is he over there risking his life? For people we don't even know and started to realize that he wasn't only doing it for them he was doing it for us here at home as well and so i i said uh, i grew up in a free country i've enjoyed everything we have in, in this country i want to give back and so my intent was to join and even if it was only four years uh, stand guard to defend this country if needed to go to war but um i i didn't do so good in high school. I uh, made some bad decisions, hung out with bad crowds, and it wasn't until about my junior year I realized that uh, when I got my report card that uh, I was failing. And I was failing my parents who were working hard to provide us the best life they could. I was failing myself, and uh, my dreams of joining the Army weren't probably going to come true. And so I made a uh, self assessment and I uh, Changed school, stopped hanging around with the bad influences, made straight A's, and uh, joined the Army as soon as I graduated high school. Well, I went to half a semester of college, and then uh, my dad, he's like, hey, didn't school start two weeks ago? And he's like, yeah, but I leave in a week to basic training. Um, it was something that I really wanted to do at the time, and uh, my cousin was in the Rangers at the time, and he, he was telling me about it, and we weren't at war. But I figured if we, if I did have to go to war for some reason, that I wanted to be with the best, the, the ones that train nonstop, that volunteer multiple times uh, for not only the Army, but Airborne School and Ranger School and multiple other schools and uh, just are most prepared. And so uh, I've been, I enjoyed every moment that I spent with the Ranger Regiment. Uh, let's talk about the mission on 26 May. First off, give us in uh, sort of the, in the bigger picture, what was why why what were the Rangers doing in Afghanistan at that time, and then more specifically, what was the task and purpose for the for the mission on 26 May? Um, we were at the time we were conducting uh, direct action raids, uh, uh, just about everything from uh, uh, taking away weapons, meeting with leaders, uh, working with the Indij forces. Uh, our platoon specifically was tasked as the Hilo platoon. And so anywhere the Chinooks went, we went and uh, 
it, it was living out of a rucksack, bouncing around quite a bit. In fact, our uptempo was so high, out on missions uh, almost nightly, sometimes go out and come back and have to go out a couple times in a night. And so uh, um, that, that morning, uh, May 26, 2008, it was, uh, it, it was they, the night before they had a high value target moving in country. And they said, whatever AO this target pops up and whoever's the closest is gonna action on him. And it just so happens that morning I was in the talk, checking my email and there was one other officer in there and he jumps up from across the room behind his laptop and he says, Petrie, go wake up the pilots, get everybody up. I uh, didn't even ask questions, just went and did it. And uh, I knew something was spinning up. And so uh, I, I go to tell my guys to get ready and I, I go to the chow hall uh, or chow tent, whatever. And uh, we'd been stuck out a couple uh, days before we got uh, helos had to we had to remain overnight and over day till the next uh, cover of darkness for the helos to come grab us so nobody was really prepared for that and uh, the younger guys kind of morale goes down so I, I figured I'd grab some lickies and chewies to stick in my cargo pocket for them in case we get stuck out there and as I'm walking through this place is decorated like the fourth of July red white and blue everywhere and I get to the end of the table and there's a sheet cake and it says happy Memorial Day. And I kind of paused for a moment and uh, had my thoughts. And then I was like, man, it's already May, end of May. And I, you lose track of time. That's how busy we were. And immediately went and checked on my guys, checked the gear, checked my gear. We went in and did some quick planning. And next thing we know, we're loading up on Chinooks and headed out to do a daylight raid for this high value target. Two, two follow-on questions from that one. One broadly and one sort of specific to this mission. Um, you say you got this mission and very quickly you're rolling. How much time did you get to plan? Is that normal? And how were you able to mitigate the fact that you had these short spin-up times? And then secondly, was there anything unusual about doing a, a daytime helicopter raid? We, we always planned uh, for time-sensitive targets. Um, it was one of our... Uh, I guess uh, uh, training objectives is to be able to quick plan. Um, usually it, it didn't work out like that. Usually we had a lot of time and rehearsals and everything, but this was uh, different. This was something that needed to be actioned on immediately. And so we did some uh, quick hasty planning. I wouldn't say probably less than an hour. We were up and uh, moving and, and uh, the, uh, the strange part about it, uh, one of my leaders said it. I don't know. Uh, some of the cadets may have watched that video that they put up. They put out earlier that uh, it was different. You could see the emotions in everyone's faces instead of the green faces. And I knew that historically we took casualties during daylight raids because we're on a more even field, and uh, had no idea that I was going to be one of them that day. But I uh, went in mentally prepared. I uh, was thinking about that. Okay, we're probably going to take some casualties. What do, where do I need to be? What do I need to do if they're next to me? And uh, just thinking of all the things that could possibly happen, all the contingencies along along the uh, flight out there. Sort of, a, sort of uh, another related question. This might be more for Ranger missions um, in general over there, uh, but this one in specific. So you went in with a plan, at least a, a hasty plan. How often during your raids did the, did the operation go just according to plan? And if it did not, well, how were you guys able to mitigate the fact that um, it did, that things did not follow the plan to a T? I'd say in all my deployments, probably only a couple of times it went according to plan. And it, uh, it uh, but we all remained flexible and we knew how to adjust to the changing situations, the environment, the weather, whatever, uh, the number of enemy, whatever uh, the case may be, we uh, we were flexible enough to adjust. Uh, sometimes we'd think that the target was in one built compound, and uh, then we'd get follow-on missions. Hey, he's we found out he's in the next village. All right, now we're humping over those two hills to get to the next village. And so uh, having that flexibility was key to uh, being successful. And I don't think uh, any of our missions were unsuccessful. Uh, there was some that were 
lighter than expected. A lot of, sometimes you go expecting a fight and it's a dry hole or they just give up, which is always the better case. <laughs> so, um, could you walk us through? So you, you, you take off and you do you're doing a helicopter assault. And so you can take it off. Can you take, uh, talk us through from landing and first off, did you land on the objective or offset and then walk us up to the incident with the grenade? So what, what, what's everything from landing to, uh, to the grenade? Okay, um, we we landed about 300 meters off off target. Uh, we were splitting the force uh, because there was multiple compounds that we were going to be executing at the same time. And as soon as we came off the helicopter, we started taking contact. There was a guy in the field shooting an AK-47, and uh, the politically correct term, we neutralized the threat. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, as we were going over and uh, PL and I were clearing the body, uh, we heard a radio call from one of our junior squad leaders who had gone into the wrong compound. And it's a, it's a rural environment, so uh, there's not many out there, but uh, he was uh, he was readjusting and I, I told the tune leader, hey, I'm going to go provide overwatch and guidance for him. And he said, go ahead. And I took off. By the time I caught up to his squad, they had already breached the wall out, outer wall of the compound and so I followed them in they were committed they went straight across the compound into the two-story building in the back corner and I stopped in the doorway as they entered and I said give me another guy we need to clear this courtyard in the adjacent smaller building and as soon as I felt a bump up on my shoulder I didn't even look need to look to see who it was I, I knew I had a guy with me and we started to move and as we started to move to the adjacent building uh, as we're crossing this little open way, uh, two guys popped up, AK-47s, at the hip, and they were just spraying. And I, I felt a round hit my left thigh. I had never been shot before, but I, I knew that must have been what it, what it was because it felt like a sledgehammer smashing in my left thigh. And immediately uh, did kind of like the deer buck when a deer gets shot. But mentally, I knew I needed to get out of the kill zone before get hit by more of those bullets and so got behind the cover uh pfc robinson who was with me behind me he got shot just below his left arm and uh, we didn't know how bad it was at the time we found out later that he had his side plates and it was about an eighth of quarter to an eighth of an inch of going over that side plate had it been a little bit higher it would have taken out all his major organs and that was really a key thing that uh those were kind of new at the time the side plates, but um, inspecting your guys was important because some guys would let them hang really low down by the waist. And it's like, you're not protecting anything down there. You need to have it up here where your heart and your lungs, all the important stuff is. And so we get pinned down behind this small building and it, it, it's probably about seven feet wide. And they're shooting around the sides and I immediately prepped a, uh, all I had on me was a thermal barrack grenade. And so I prepped that and threw it over, figured it would uh, at least have that concussion ability to uh, throw them off guard and stall them for a while. And when it went off, uh, Sergeant Higgins, it did. We got a lull in fire and Sergeant Higgins comes running over. And I immediately looked to my right where Robinson was. I was having him watch that corner and I was watching the corner to my left as I had my back to the building and I said, Help, help him watch that corner. My biggest fear was they were gonna come around the corners and finish us off. And so I'm staying on the radio, trying to paint the picture for my leadership, telling them that we got wounded Rangers, we're still in heavy small arms contact, and we hear a blast. And it kind of knocks those two to the ground and they're, they're in shock and they turn around and they're like, what the heck was that? And I say, they're throwing grenades, keep your heads down, keep watching that corner. And got back on the radio, gave an update, I'm watching my corner. I, I kind of crouched down almost in a seated position because my leg was hurting at that time. I didn't know I was shot through both my thighs. I thought it was just the one thigh at the time and I figured they'll dig the bullet out later if it's still in there. And so uh, while I'm sitting there, um, I'm doing my checks, I'm watching my side and as I go back to check on my guys, one of my checks, I see a, a pineapple grenade sitting on the ground right behind him. And I knew it wasn't one of ours because we stopped using pineapple grenades a long time ago and immediately saw it as a threat and 
first reaction was get it away from him. And I reached over, I grabbed it. And as I was tossing it away, I opened my hand to release it. And I had my head down, which uh, um, it took a lot of the blast that the Mitch helmet and my, my eye pro, which I still have peppered in shrapnel and then blood. And um, I was one of those guys that took off my eye pro because it fog up. And I'd rather, I was like, I'd rather be able to see. And for whatever reason, it, we were going so fast, I didn't take off my eye pro when it was fogging up because I didn't have time. And it, it really saved my eyes. Um, I, I have had the same mistake doing my own yard work since I got out and realized the Sergeant Major is not, not an idiot. Where are your eye pro, Leroy? But uh, I, I, um, as soon as I tossed it, I sat back up and, and the hand was completely gone at the wrist. And it, it almost looked uh, surreal. It was oozing blood and I could smell the burns from the grenade. I, I, I could see dirt and debris in there. The radius and the ulna were poking up about a quarter of an inch. And there was some skin just hanging around the sides like a skirt. And then reality, then, then uh, what's weird, what went into my mind was, why isn't this thing spraying blood three feet in the air, like in Hollywood movies? And then uh, reality kicked in and I said, okay, I know how to take care of this. And I reached out over, grabbed my tourniquet and applied my tourniquet, tightened it down with my teeth and immediately checked on my guys who both got minor shrapnel. In fact, they both went on missions the next day and stayed in the military for some time afterwards. And um, I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't stop making those radio calls. I kept giving updates constantly to my leadership, letting them know what was going on. And that, that was my intent was, even if I had to use my last breath to give a radio call that may help some of my guys, that's what I wanted to do. Thank you. I think you uh, actually just anticipated the question I asked was going to, was going to ask was, I mean, you, you just had a very traumatic in injury, had enough, enough uh, presence of mind to put your own tourniquet on, but you easily could have done a tap out and said, I, I, I'm, I'm battle unaffected. And I think if I remember from reading the write-up, uh, I think the first sergeant even was saying, let's get you evacuated. And then a medic was trying to treat you and you're turning them down. What, what was driving you to, to not tap out um, and turn down the aid instead of keep in, instead you kept going? We, I got when we finally got to the uh, um, casualty uh, collection point. I'm looking around. There's there's guys. There's blood everywhere, and guys are getting treated. And Doc comes running up to me, and he's like, "Hey, Petru, we need to take a look at you." And I said, "No, I'm good. Help those guys." Mentally, I was still in the fight. I didn't. Uh, I think the adrenaline and everything. I, I wanted to keep doing what a leader does: take care of his guys. And he says, "We already got people helping them." Uh, we need to help you. And I said, I already got a tourniquet. I already stopped the bleeding. And he said, well, we need to take a look at your legs. And that was the first time I really looked down at my legs. And my pants were soaked with blood all the way from my thighs down to my boots. And mentally, I wanted to stay in the fight. But physically, I knew that I was going to run out of juice. And so I, I sat down and I let them uh, put tourniquets on my legs and they prepped me for Exville. But even as they were carrying me to the HLZ for medevac, I had guys running up to the uh, litter and saying, hey, you're going to be all right, Petrie. We're going to get those guys. And I'm pushing them away. I'm telling them, get away from me. Go pull security. <laughs> my biggest fear at that point is they're going to get shot coming to comfort me. And right. two, I might get shot while I'm in the stretcher because they're slowing us down and I can't defend myself, which is worse. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, just staying, staying in the fight mentally was the biggest portion of it is doing everything I could till the last moment. So you so eventually you do get evacuated. You finally finally listen to the, the advice of medics and first sergeants and, and get evacuated. And then next thing you wake up in launch tool. Could you walk us through what happened from waking up? And I understand there's a humorous story. There might be a humorous story there. Over. Well, um, we got we have some uh, we have our blue book standards in the regiment and when you were in uniform, you had that blue book in your cargo pocket every time. And uh, you those were the, the, the guidance, the discipline that, that really embodied who the Rangers were. And 
One of them was to shave every single day to include weekends, holidays, leave. And when I woke up, the nurse there in Germany said, how you doing? And I said, I'm doing OK. And she said, can I get you anything? And I said, can you get me some shaving cream and a razor? And she looks at me and does this double take and she's like, what, what, what was that? And I said, can you get me a razor and some shaving cream? And mentally, in, in my mind, I was worried about a colonel, a general, a sergeant major, somebody from my unit or somebody even worse, somebody from a different unit coming in and seeing me unshaven. And uh, it probably wouldn't have batted an eye at it because I was in pretty bad condition, but, but uh, mentally I was still in it. I was still in the military and I was still adhering to those rules and those uh, standards that we held each other accountable for. Hey, thanks. Uh, I think we're, I'm going to do one transition question, then we're going to hand it over to the cadets. So my transition question is, you have a thousand future lieutenants and junior officers dialed in in the audience right now listening to what you're saying. Do you have any guidance or suggestions that you'd like to give to them so they can learn how to uh, accomplish their mission while they're taking care of their soldiers? Wow. Something no, we don't have enough time. I, I'd love <laughs> to share a lot with you, but um, um, the biggest thing is uh, take care of yourself and your team. And uh, resiliency, I think, is um, something that you develop over time. And it, it, it really goes with that saying, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. I was one of those privates that got scuffed up nonstop. And I thought my team leader and my squad leader hated me and it would have been called hazing a lot back then. But then mentally I realized they can only scuff me up till I reach muscle failure. And the only thing it's going to do for me is make me better at PT. So scuff me up all you want. And, and, it, and it wasn't bad because I've seen other guys getting scuffed up too. But it was usually... Um, not that I messed up a lot. Sometimes it was just for their humor, but uh, it was it was one of those things that pain makes the memory help uh, makes the mind remember. It helps with memory. It's like a, a um, one of those things where a kid goes toward a, a light socket. You spank them on the hand and say, "Don't do that." They're probably not going to go back. Well, you sit them down and you say, "Hey." You can't stick that metal object in there or else 10,000 volts is going to go through your tiny body and probably kill you. Well, as soon as you turn around, that toddler is like, what's 10,000 volts? Yeah. And so that pain associates the, the mind with memory. And so sometimes the scuffings were good for me because it made me realize not to do stuff again. Uh, the other thing is uh, don't be afraid to, uh, to make mistakes. We're all human, uh, even as leaders, it, but learn from them. Try to mitigate them before they so that you don't make mistakes, learn from others mistakes, but they don't become problems until you don't learn from them and not make them again. And uh, I'll tell you one thing is that I was a recycle in ranger school. I, was, I didn't make it all the way through first time. And it, uh, it's one of those things. I, I didn't make it through jump master my first time either, but I made it through and I didn't give up and I didn't get down on myself when I got recycled. I just said, I got to try harder. I got to keep climbing that mountain and study harder and I got to do better. And that, that's one of the things is do something every day to improve yourself and others. If you commit to that, you're going you're gonna to see a lot of improvement all around you. And the, diff the second thing is decisions. Decisions uh, have two outcomes, minimum good or bad. And when you find the outcome, you might have to make another decision to readjust in a different direction. When I joined the military, the motto was be all you can be. And it wasn't for yourself. It was for the people to your right and to your left. And that meant being 100%. And it meant physically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally, all, all of those combined. And don't be afraid to let someone know, hey, I need to take a knee. If you're having difficulty, go talk to somebody. 
uh, we, we're so quick in the military to say, hey, I can't go on the five mile run tomorrow. I twisted my ankle. We're not so quick to say, hey, I need to talk to uh, a psychologist or something. I'm having some uh, either relationship issues or financial issues, whatever it may be. Don't don't go at it alone. That's the one thing that we learn in the military is things are easier when you do it as a team or you have a buddy. Um, one of the things uh, uh, General Buzzard and I talked about was uh, Coach K, uh, basketball coach, accountability. When he was coaching Team USA, he said the hardest part was trying to have accountability. They were telling these guys they get fined a thousand dollars if they show up late to practice. And he says, "What's that to guys like LeBron James? Just come in with a stack of money here. I'll be late the rest of the week." And so. So they had guys showing the plate and he found the best way to hold accountability was make them responsible to each other. And so the team decided what the penalties were going to be for each other if they showed up late and that they were failing each other by showing up late. Um, engage in community when you're out there. Uh, look for support. One of the things that we did in, in Second Ranger Battalion is we were always isolated and up there at Fort Lewis, JBLM, there there wasn't a lot of military support. It's still kind of minimal and uh, it's different views. But uh, what we re realized is that we needed to engage with the people, the communities around us. When they closed the bases in 2001, people real didn't realize what's behind those gates and what really goes on. I mean, to them, it was like Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Nobody's ever gone in there. And so uh, what we ended up doing was what I thought was awesome. They took our award ceremony after our deployment and we started doing it at a local high school, stadium high school in Tacoma and encouraged the public to come attend and see what these young men and women were, were doing. And, and uh, the other thing would be uh, oh, discipline. Have, have, don't lose your discipline. Um, have your personal standards above and always try to exceed the standard, not just achieve it. Uh, the other uh, one of the things um, I got to do was I got to speak at a graduation. It was a company SAP. And they did a program called NS2 Service where they brought veterans in and they put them in a hotel and they went to like a, a conference room. And they did classes. What normally takes two years in IT certificates, they were doing these and like I think it was like 10 months or so and 18 started 18 graduated and I showed up the night before because I spoke at their graduation and I started asking them the questions how was it what was it like how, and a lot of them said they had portions of the school where they struggled and then they said you know if it wasn't for the person across the hallway that helped me study in this area I wouldn't be here today at graduation and that that's really what that means is that Reach out. You know what your strengths and weaknesses are. Help others with your strengths and seek help for the, the weaknesses that that you're weak in. Uh, no, nobody likes to say the word weakness. And we all feel like we're uh, superhuman when we put on body armor and our kit and that uniform. But the truth is, I tell people, unless that grenade was kryptonite, I'm human too. <laughs> but uh, um, the one thing that was awesome is though every one of those students got put into an $80,000 job minimum starting. And uh, they did it together. Uh, the other thing is um, know your team. Uh, what, what separates leadership, uh, small details uh, are noticed by the lowest level. If you come and you know the privates in your platoon, but you don't know that, say, John is married and he has three little girls, they're infants and one's uh, uh, an exceptional family member. You got to know more on how to take care of that person and, and their specific family because that affects his uh, uh, mental health as well and his performance. If something's going on and you're not aware of those, get to know everyone in, around you on your team and take care of their welfare. Um, when you're when you're with your platoon sergeant, it's like a marriage. It's a temporary marriage. So if it's, it's not a good marriage, it's not, it's not going to be forever. But while you're in that marriage, you have children. 
and they are your responsibility. And one of the hard times that I saw, one of the biggest things that uh, affected our platoon's morale was we had a platoon chart in PL that were like those fighting parents all the time, except they did it in front of the platoon. And it was the most negative thing for the platoon. It brought down morale and you started to see arguments and fights amongst the platoon spawn off of that. So handle your business between your platoon sergeant and you in private. Don't let that be exposed to the rest of the, the group because they're the, you're the fatherly and motherly parents, whatever you want to call it, that they look up to. And so uh, the, other, the other thing would be, uh, the question I get asked is fear, were you ever afraid? Absolutely. I was afraid every single day I was deployed. I wasn't afraid of dying. I made my peace with God and I said goodbye to my family and I knew it might be the last time I see him. But what I was afraid of was I would miss an IED in, a, in the road. I would miss a shooter in the window. I would miss something that would get one of my guys killed. And what I did was I turned that fear into something positive, awareness. I made sure to keep an extra lookout. I made sure that when we had downtime, instead of just saying, hey, play Xbox every time we have downtime, I gave them a little bit of free time, but there, there was extra time. I'd take other uh, resources and I'd teach them new stuff. Hey, bring the medics in. I know you taught us Ranger first responder, but teach us more of what you know because you're, you got more in-depth knowledge or mortars or whatever, just increasing them to be the best prepared they could. And training sometimes is going to suck, but you want it to suck really bad because when reality hits, it's going to seem easy. You always train harder than, than what you expect so that it, it doesn't uh, become that difficult. Um, look for greatness and inspiration all around. You think about why you joined the military or, or why you took the steps to go to West Point. Somebody inspires you. Be that inspiration for somebody else. Um, one of the things that uh, I, know, I know I'm getting toward the end here, but uh, Mark, Mark Cuban, I went to a basketball game and uh, something that I noticed different from him than many uh, owners of teams is he sits down in the corner of the of the uh, the court and he's down there in t-shirt and sweats hanging out with the team not up in an owner's box he's down there with his team showing them that he cares about them and that he's part of their team uh back briefs don't take for granted that somebody understands what you say ensure that they fully understand the mission the details whatever it may be always have back briefs. And uh, the, the last thing is that uh, the hardest thing for me to hear is when people call me a hero. Because I tell them the same thing I tell my children that dad's retired from the army. The, the men and women that are still in uniform, you all, those are the heroes. The ones that the law enforcement who protect us when we're deployed and when we're back home. So thank you to, to all of you for what you do. and. Uh, taking that challenge to uh, step up and go to West Point. Uh, it's one of those places that had I known about it as a kid, I would have tried harder. Well, I'll, I'll use that as a transition for speaking of stepping up. So we have about 10 minutes left. So Cadets, if you have a question, step up to the microphone uh, and speak your clear, uh, question uh, for Mass Army. And if you're online, type it into the Q&A box and I'll, I'll feed those questions uh, if needed. Well, I'll get one out of the way. Yes, okay. that is the U.S. Uh, Military Academy's saber behind me. Got to go there in 2012, and I'm I'm hoping to come see you guys hopefully later this year. Sounds good. And I think uh, I think we can pull that together. I might know one or two guys that can that can arrange this. Any questions from class of 2023? I will tell you that there is uh, no such thing as a stupid question. Because if you don't know the answer, then it's knowledge. All right, Leroy, we have about another seven minutes. If you have any more points you want to cover, and so we'll see. Uh, we'll see if we can resolve the combo issue on tra on why they're not transmitting. Um, shoot. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, I broke up your vibe. 
I'll give you an example. Uh, um, one of my uh, sons graduated with a, his friend, went to West Point, and he came up to me. Uh, this was about a year ago, and he, he said, uh, we were to change command. And there was a general there, and the colonel was changing command of the brigade, and he, he was a brand new lieutenant. He comes up to me afterwards. He goes, hey, Leroy, um, you think you could talk to the general? And I was like, about what? He goes, well, we're, they're giving us a couple days off for Easter, but then they want us to go to the field to practice with Miles gear. And then they're going to send us to Yakima for two weeks. Well, if we're already going to, why don't we just do the Miles in Yakima while we're going to be there? And I said, you're lucky I know you or I'd probably slap you. <laughs> I said, you want your guys to have a hard time. <laughs> it's not supposed to be easy. And uh, it, it's supposed to be tough so that they know how to react when those hard times come. And you're stuck out there. And that's just like what I was talking about the younger guys with the morale is that they're stuck. Uh, the other thing is disseminate. Disseminate information. Nothing will drive people more crazy when they sit around going, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? You haven't given us a purpose. So disseminate the information and get, always give a purpose. Uh, even if it's and, and have them realize that sometimes you're not going to get the purpose. Hey, you're doing this because I told you to. It needs to get done. They might, you might find out the purpose later, but uh, there's a reason for everything. All right, uh, I've got a question that's been handed to me. I, well, as we're still tackling some of the techno issues, um, could you, from you talked about it, the sort of the toxic or the bad PL platoon leader, platoon leader platoon sergeant relationship you saw. Could you just describe what you thought might have been was the the best PL platoon sergeant relationship and why was it so successful? Um, there, I had so many great platoon leaders and platoon sergeants, uh, but I, I learned from every single one, even the bad one examples I learned from. And what I took away from those were I applied them to my own leadership. I said, OK, when I get put in charge, I'm not going to do it like that. Or I'm going to do it like this. And uh, really what made it work the best is that they were supportive of each other. And even if they didn't agree on something, they said, oh, OK, well, we'll do it your way. And if we have to adjust fire, then we will. Uh, but they listened to each other and it, it's it's they came together for a common cause, which was the success of the mission. They, they put their. Their themselves aside, their their personal beliefs and they they really focused on what was best for the platoon and what was good for themselves. And they they led by example. They gave that inspiration like that's the kind of PL I want to be. That's the kind of platoon sergeant I want to be. And they stood out. But uh, like I said, it, it's um, there's going to be some tough times. I, 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 a lot of folks are dealing with a lot of stuff right now, especially during COVID. It's changed a lot of things the way we used to do things and we've all had to adjust. I was used to spending 220 days a year on the road since 2011 and then COVID hit and I haven't gone anywhere. And uh, it's, it's driving my wife nuts, but she's just getting a lot of honey to do list done. Yeah. But I, I also I, I miss uh, engaging with the, the troops as well. And I've gone virtual. I'm doing a lot of stuff virtual, but uh, that's the thing that is that things don't always go the way we want them to. We just got to be able to adjust and we might not have what we want, but it's not the end of the world. Um, look how crazy people went over toilet paper of all things when COVID started. And I think about one of my deployments coming back from Iraq. My wife said, um, I was called her in Germany on the way back and she said, what do you want? You want me to have a big steak ready for you? This or that? And I said, Honestly, I just want fresh vegetables. Something that's not wilted from the heat. And it, it's it's all these things we take for granted here in the States. Um, you start to realize them when you're deployed that you don't have all those luxuries. And it's it, we come back and we fall into that same routine of, oh, this is taken for granted sometimes. And one of the uh, Oh shoot, let me see if I can find it real quick. 
one of my favorite things is uh, I, I saw was always show appreciation. What's taken for granted will eventually be taken away. Then you end up missing most what you least appreciated. And so always conduct yourself in, in the best manner possible because this war has been going on for a long time. And after Vietnam, there wasn't a lot of support for the military until after 9-11. And if we don't keep a good face out in the public, we need their support. There's a lot of organizations that cover down on what the military can. Find some of those organizations because they may be support for your troops when they're going through hard times. I was not the best of young NCOs. I knew the answers to pass the board. What are, what are some uh, uh, programs? I knew the Army programs, Army Community Service, Army Emergency Relief. I didn't realize there's a lot of support out there in the civilian world of people that want to support the military and through whatever struggles they have. Any more questions? Yep, I think we're we've, we're we're going to the pace plan. So we got we're getting questions that are being phoned in from the auditorium to where I'm located. That's being given to me on hand. So there's always a pay always execute your pace plan. Um, earlier, you talked about overcoming challenges and resiliency. How can you build resiliency or just mental toughness in, in yourself or in, and maybe more importantly within your unit? I think um, one of the big things is always the, the biggest thing is mental mental preparedness. Um, I went in to combat with a clear view in my mind that I may have to do or see things that no human should ask be asked to that I might be holding my, my friend, my brother, in my arms while he takes his last breaths. I might have to pick up what's left of the remains of one of my buddies that I was besides for years. And I mentally prepared myself for the worst, just like with training, prepare for the worst, hope, but hope for the best. And that, that, is one of those things that help you come to term that uh, at the end of the day, all you can do is your best. A lot of medics have have struggled with. I put a guy, I, I prepped a guy, I put him on a medevac bird or, or a vehicle, and I never saw him again. I don't know if they made it. And you may never find that answer, but all you can do is know that you did your best while they're in your care. And if you always give 100% and you do that, uh, you won't fail. I, I will say um, taking care of yourself is the big important thing. I had a, a colonel one time and he had, uh, had been involved in, a, in an explosion, TBI, a traumatic brain injury, and he was having memory issues. And uh, we were talking and he said, I, I graduated with a rocket engineering degree. And if I don't write something down in my green leader notebook, I can't remember it. And I told him, so we, we could send you anywhere in the country to go get the best treatment, the NICO clinic, all these different facilities. He says, I can't, I, I gotta take, I'm moving to, to take over this next command. And I said, you're doing a disservice to that next command if you're not 100%. Because what happens when you, you can't take out that leader's notebook and, uh, so always, I mean, don't be afraid to take that knee and say, hey, I need to go better myself so I could be 100% for the people that are counting on me. Okay. okay. Uh, next question is coming from uh, one of the online uh, observers and a question that anyone who's been to Ranger School will understand. Uh, what is the best way to combat low morale? Oh, man. Um, variety variety keeps keeps it interesting for for people um one of the best things that i had was we get, we had this new platoon leader that came to us and he had done a, quite a bit of time in delta and he, he organized a uh, off-site training a couple of times and a uh, little little uh, outside the box but, and uh, probably not the best uh, things but we we hit a, a armory National Guard Armory 
And it was all planned. We, we went in the back of a box truck, these U-Hauls, and pulled up to the front. And as we all ran out, we stormed it. And we were using Sims rounds. Of course, the uh, 240s were using blanks. And that town got more 911 calls than, than they ever have in their history. But for us, it was exciting. It was something different that we didn't do. It wasn't the normal go to the range, build the, the plywood mock-ups or go to the already built mount site you've been to a hundred times. Uh, we, we used uh, different facilities on base. Uh, we used the water treatment facility a few times and it was just that variety of not the same thing. It was uh, something different and that really keeps them interested. The next question comes was called in from a cadet and it sounds and it goes out like it sounds like you remember some great teams. How did you create a positive culture within the units you were a part of? Man, just always coming in with a positive attitude, even in the worst of situations. Uh, I look at I'm fortunate. Um, I can't run worth a darn because I lost a lot of muscle tissue in my legs, but uh, and the hand thing's not the best, but I have buddies that, that that lost both their legs above the knee, and they look at me and they're like, I'd rather lose both my legs than one of my hands. You just do too much with your hands. And I said, yeah, but I could get up in the middle of the night and not crawl on the floor, or get a chair, or have to put on prosthetics to go use a bathroom. <laughs> and they said, I guess you're right. And I said, they all have their ups and downs, but uh, one of my uh, good friends who really an inspiration, he lost he was the first survivor. He lost all four limbs, both his hands and his legs. Uh, he got a double arm transplant. He's a great young kid. And uh, he, I'll tell you, he has the, the best outlook on life. Uh, seems like people that got scratches more feel more sorry for himself than, than he does. But I think having that quick brush with death can give you that second life. I tell folks I wake up every morning and when I breathe air into my lungs and I open my eyes, I'm grateful that I have another day. So I go at it 100% positive. I got one more day to make an influence, positive impact on somebody else and to improve myself. I'm going to uh, use the interviewer's prerogative while we're waiting for the next question coming. I'm going to take it back to operations back in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and it relates to the question on if the plan, if the operation went, went, went in accordance to plan. And specifically, was the control of the operation, was it always the PL controlling everything or was control decentralized? And if so, how did you make that work? Oh, um, he had actually fled before we, as we were approaching, I guess. Um, I think they, they ended up, uh, F, FBI, Ended, ended up uh, extraditing him from another country. I think it was 2013 or so. And uh, they were going to ask me to testify, but and I would have, but uh, uh, they said they didn't need me to because he squealed like a canary and just sang, sang, sang a great song for him. But uh, the, um, the responsibility, I think, ultimately fell on the platoon leader but each squad leader down to the private, everyone had their individual responsibility to that platoon leader to be successful at the portion that they were given. And developing leaders at the lowest level was the part that I loved. Seeing those privates that were thinking on their own, that they see an empty uh, corner where nobody's pulling security, and they go over there and they start pulling security. They don't wait for somebody to tell them. They're taking the initiative. And as a leader, that's great to see. But sometimes you'd have to grab them and say, hey, good initiative, but I need you over here instead. And so uh, encouraging younger younger troops to have that, that, that critical thinking on their own and to take initiative is, is one of the best things you can encourage and makes things work better. I mean, the team cohesion. Look look for things to do outside of work. Uh, nobody wants mandatory fun, Make, uh, but, but have it optional or have something that may interest a lot of folks. Uh, one of the best memories I had was we went on a company ski trip 
and you could sign up. Most people sign up for it because even if they didn't ski, they're going up to the lodge and just hanging out and snowball fights or whatever. But uh, look for something fun outside of work to uh, build that cohesion and try to include families if you can. A lot of times families are forgotten, but uh, they sacrifice too. They worry about us. They, they uh, struggle while we're gone. All right, Leroy, we've got about a minute and a half to two minutes to left. So the last question is going to be, for those of us wanting to go to ranger school, any tips? Yes, um, I get asked this question quite a bit. Um, look to your left and to your right. Uh, every day, when you look to your left and to your right, there's going to be somebody that's sucking worse than you are. It's on those days you go try to pick them up and help them out. Because I guarantee you, during your time there at ranger school, Somebody's going to be looking at you and you're going to be their right or left and hopes that they come and they help you out when you need it. That uh, build good relationships there. Uh, some some friends you'll last for a lifetime. I just linked up with my ranger buddy from ranger school. He's a captain in SF. I hadn't seen him since 2001 when I went through ranger school. I saw him last year and we've we've stayed connected. Okay, with that, well, Leroy, Master Sergeant Pedro, on behalf of the Commandant of the Cadets and the West Point Class of 2023, your primary audience, I'd like to thank you for your time and insights today. Uh, it's been a great, uh, I wish I had more time. Okay, I could I could keep keep doing the Q&A for a while. It's very fascinating. So thanks again for your time and uh, best of luck and Godspeed to you. Thank you, sir, and best of luck to you all. From all of the folks here at the Modern War Institute, we would like to thank you for watching our videos and invite you to explore our podcasts and our webpage linked below.